You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Good afternoon. This is the Extension Hour here on Lone Star Community Radio. This is Jenny Adams uh, from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. We've got a great show here for you today, talking to some master gardeners, answering some questions you might have about what's going on in the garden. Um, we've got Linda Crum, we've got Bill Boynton, and Jim Bunshow here today. Good morning. Good morning. Afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> it is afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to let Linda talk about some events they have coming up. So go ahead, Linda. Okay, all our programs are at the Ag- Texas AgriLife facilities in the Tom Leroy Education Building right on Airport Road across the street from the Lone Star Convention Center. And the programs are designed for adults. Uh, we don't have any child care, and they are really expensive. A whole $5 <laughs> will get you into our program. Uh, coming up on July the 8th, we have rainwater harvesting and irrigation and that is uh, really important in the summertime here when we have these dry spells and tend to uh, overwater or wastewater. It's nice to have uh, a good irrigation system. And on August the 12th, that's another Saturday, we'll have a program on bees and how important they are in pollinating our gardens. And if you want to go down to the woodlands on August the 26th, Skip Richter will be there, and you'll need to go online and register for that program on the Woodlands Township website. All right. So, Linda, you were in the phone room this morning. What kind of questions have you been getting lately? Well, the phones were a little bit quiet this morning, but uh, we have seen an uptick in uh, insect activity in the garden with the hot weather that's coming. Anytime your plants are under stress, whether it be from lack of water or heat or lack of nutrition, that just invites the insects to take advantage of them. And uh, Wednesday, when we were working in the garden, we noticed one of the beds was full of mealybugs and leafhoppers. So uh, you might want to, your best uh, way to control pests in the garden is to get out there every day and catch them early. All right, Bill, have you had anything in the phone room lately that people have been calling about? Well, I've been sort of hiding out of the phone room uh, recently, so I've been calling in mainly to do some insect identification. But uh, out in the garden itself, we've been, like she says, seeing things. This morning I saw some box elder bugs out, which are fairly common this time of year. The leaf-footed bug is another one that's very prominent, can be told by the uh, hind leg, the expanded uh, leg segment looks like a little tiny leaf. Uh, you also get stink bugs this time of year. And with Linda saying about the mealy bug, there's also a very small uh, lady uh, bird beetle that is predaceous on the mealy bug. And in fact, it looks the larva looks very much like a mealy bug, but it's a very fast mover and it'll be eating insects and other insects that are attacking plants. So when you're out there, take a good clean eye at the insect and make sure it's not a good guy a that good you're, one. <laughs> you're wiping out. But uh, they will be voracious feeders of your aphids and uh, mites and things like that. Are those the ladybug larvae you're talking about? Uh, yes. the uh, Almost look like a little alligator. Yeah, most of them do. But on the mealybug destroyer, it actually resembles very much a mealybug. Hmm. And it's, like you say, a fast mover on the plant so it can come up there and grab the other insect uh, nymphs and uh, immatures. All right. Um, so what can people do to control some of their pests? Well, as Linda said, get out there early. <laughs> cast your shadow in the garden. Uh, look for the insects and try to make sure that you understand what you're trying to get rid of rather than destroying every insect in your garden. Well, the best best thing to do on some of these insects is to take uh, the garden hose and just a hard water spray and spray them off the insects. And yep. 
especially if it's a soft-bodied insect such as aphids. People say, well, won't they just go right back on? And I say, well, it's kind of like dropping you out of a plane over New Jersey. You're not going to get back on. So they're, they're fairly uh, short-lived off the plant. And thumb and forefinger is a good insect control if, yes. you, if you've got the ability to do it. If need be, put a nitrile glove on and it's not as icky. But, uh... <laughs> well, I keep a, t a can of soapy water by the back door and go out, and especially leaf-footed bugs when they get big. There's not much that I would use that would kill them, and so I just pick them off the plants and dump them in the soapy water. And I found if you get out there early, they're, they're fairly dormant. And right, they're, they're not a little really slower. quite as active. That's right. Early in the morning, late in the evening, you can knock them off into a bucket of soapy water and go on about your business. All right, I did not know that. So that's very interesting. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I'll make a comment. The uh, big business likes you to be entomophobic, afraid of every insect use our spray it'll kill anything mm -hmm. and uh, you know if you let things go out there uh, like we have aphids on some uh, milkweed plants right now but if you look you'll see some very uh, parchment colored aphids there that are very sedentary they're parasitized by a little wasp and if you go out there and see a colony of aphids that are moving and then you see next these little parchment ones, they're parasitized. So if you let them hatch out and don't spray them or hit them with a pesticide, they will come out and that uh, little tiny wasp, mainly a braconid wasp, will go and parasitize other aphids there. And there's also been, uh, we've seen surfid fly larvae. They are sort of look like a little piece of mucus sometimes on the leaf. But they also are very voracious aphid eaters. And then you'll get, like uh, Jim had said earlier, the little alligator-looking things. I like to look at them as more like a Gila monster-looking thing. <laughs> but uh, they will consume quite a quantity of aphids. And again, then you'll see the pupae on the uh, leaf, which will be sort of orange-colored and sort of just a, a bumpy lump there. And that's the, uh, the stage between the larvae that looks like the... Uh, the alligator or whatever you want to call it, the Gila monster, and the adult that's very distinctive with the elytra with the, uh, usually there's uh, black spots on the red wings. Okay, and to the everyday person, can you describe what aphids are and what they do? Okay, aphids are a piercing sucking insect. Uh, they're in the family, or the order of insects known as homoptera, which means their wings are folded over the top of their body when they're at rest. Uh, they have some interesting life stages in that the, in this area they pretty much stay as a wingless adult most of their life. The female reproduces without uh, having any uh, mating, so she is a parthenogenic pre producer and she gives live birth. So if you want a big word for your cocktail, it's ovoviviparous parthenogenic reproduction. That's it? Yeah, it's just simple. <laughs> just off the tip of your tongue, but <laughs> aphids are uh, piercing, sucking feeders. They will stick their stylets into a vein of a plant, and they just sit there, and the plant osmotic pressure will push the sugar water through it, and it'll form honeydew, which usually honeydew droplets on a tree that's, if you park your car underneath it, you'll see these little shiny dots, and you'll also see little uh, black spots where the sooty mold comes in to consume the uh, sugar water. So, but, but generally aphids, uh, you will we'll have winged adults, you'll also have male and female, but the majority of what you'll see here is a female which is producing uh, live birth uh, young. What size are these insects, Bill? They're about an eighth of an inch to three sixteenths of an inch long. Well, the, the, yeah, the aphids are real common. You know, you'll see those as just soft-bodied almost little white uh, specks, and I see them about a sixteenth of an inch. Is yeah, they're, commonly pretty, they're very tiny. Very tiny. Yeah, but and, and the females are born pregnant, basically. Right. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, the, the, the aphids come in designer colors. You can get them in yellow, orange, Yeah, spotted, I've seen the bright green. red ones at the office a yeah. lot of times. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you can get it. You know, you want a color, go look for them. They're there. So. <laughs> you know, speaking of insects in the garden, about 95 to 96, Seven percent of the insects you have in the garden are either uh, beneficial or have no effect at all on your plants. 
insects. It's only about 3% that are pest insects. And so when everybody gets all upset about insects in the garden, you need to go to the books and really educate yourself on these little. All right. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with the Montgomery County Master Gardeners here on the Extension Hour. Attention movie lovers, The Ticket Stub is a new radio show servicing Montgomery County that is meant for you. The Ticket Stub is available live every Thursday at noon on FM 104.5 and 106.1, as well as anytime on IronLoneStar.com. Connor and Dick will let you know what's coming out in the theater, what is worth streaming, and what's going on in the world of film. The Ticket Stub, your home for movie talk. A Lone Star Community Radio is ready for the summer. If you or anyone you know is looking for summer internship opportunities, A Lone Star Community Radio is a great place to grab the mic and be on the air. A Lone Star Community Radio offers a great opportunity to those interested in learning about the radio world all year round. Be an on-air personality, talk show producer, or YouTube TV podcast editor. Contact the station at info at IRLoneStar.com or call the station's message line at 936-647-3776. And we're back on the Extension Hour here at Lone Star Community Radio. I'm talking with the Montgomery County Master Gardeners who are part of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Um, we're out there on Airport Road just across from the Lone Star Convention Center. Um, and we're talking bugs um, Bill's going to talk a little bit more about um, different insects and the benefits and um, how to <laughs> how control, to, how to yeah, and like how to deal with them. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Uh, you'll often hear a concept called IPM or integrated pest management, and that's a system uh, with the big boys. You have scouts that go out in like your cotton fields, and they'll walk the field and see what insects are prevalent. They'll also look for predators, parasites, and you may have, uh, like in the San Joaquin Valley in California, you might have a square mile cotton field, but of that square mile, you might have one small section, maybe 50 by 60 feet in there, that might have an outbreak of cotton bullworm. I know we're not growing cotton right here, but as an example, so instead of spraying the whole square mile of it, you would go in and treat that small area with a pesticide. You may use something like Bt, Bacillus thuringiogensis, a bacterial spore, which would kill the caterpillar. It would not be toxic to birds or pests or, or birds and some other insects like your honeybee and stuff like that. Uh, the other thing with integrated pest management, which is often overlooked, there's an economic factor involved. And in a lot of our home gardens, we like this spring, we'll see on citrus, uh, citrus leaf miner, and it's cosmetically, yes, it's a blemish on the leaf, but the leaf is still photosynthetic. It's still producing food for the plant. Uh, yes, you can spray for it. You can put on a systemic insecticide, which will then prevent you from eating your citrus. But, uh, you know, it's a cosmetic thing. Just let it be. It's, it's not going to hurt anything. So these are some things to consider when you uh, go out there and look at that insect. Uh, I know a lot of people are fearful of insects. Uh, and sometimes we cause problems when we use pesticides, especially the organic phosphates. They tend to be a nerve agent. Uh, and again, a lot of them came out of uh, nerve agent research. Uh, and what will happen is if an insect has a sublethal dose, a lot of times they'll be more aggressive. So like if you give a honeybee a sublethal dose of a pesticide, they become very aggressive. They'll be stinging at you, buzzing at you. Whereas had they not been poisoned, they would have just left you alone. So in some of these cases, it's, uh, you know, you just sort of aggravate the situation instead of making it better. Right. I, th I think one of the things that you're getting at is what's called best management practice. You know, what's the least harm we can do to get the best result that we can? And in our home garden, sometimes it's as easy as, uh, as Linda said, just a hard hose spray of water and knock the insects off. I've also found that sometimes leaving a crop, especially um, like this time of year, cabbage and or broccoli, to flower 
will become a trap crop for some of the harlequin bugs that are so common in our area. Um, have you seen that, Bill? Yes, the harlequin bug is a form of a, a stink bug, and uh, taxonomically speaking, it's a hemiptera, which means it's a hemi-wing, part membrose wing, part hard wing, and it's a... Uh, How would you describe it in color and size? Well, it's predominantly black with orange and white markings yep. on it, and if you think of the harlequin clown, it, it will strike an example. Uh, right. Example... Uh, a good example for it. I know I see them, you know, they'll get uh, they'll get real prominent on some of the, the brassicas in the garden and they're again a stinging and rasping or a sucking and rasping insect. Well, another uh, way to control insects in the garden, and I use this a lot, is to invite birds to your garden. Feed the birds and they will, they're mostly insect eating little creatures in fact, um, my favorite bird is Carolina chickadee. They only nest once a year. And they'll have anywhere from five to eight baby birds to feed. They only feed their babies caterpillars. They don't feed them any other kind of insect. They feed them caterpillars. And it takes 5,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch of Carolina chickadees. And that is an awful lot of traveling back. No wonder they only nest once a year. They're tired. <laughs> but um, And if they didn't have the caterpillars, they wouldn't be there. No, they looking. wouldn't be That's there. Right. And their babies would not survive. That's right. So uh, mainly they get on the oak trees, find the caterpillars. So if you see caterpillars in the spring, think of them as baby Carolina chickadee food. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what they're there for. Well... It, it is a management practice that we kind of look at as a, as a whole, holistic approach. You can't just spray it into a, into a sterile environment. You've got to have room for the pests and the predators. The circle of life. That's right. <laughs> Another thing that's very important on your pest management is what is going on in your soil. Because if you have a very mineral soil with very little organic matter, you don't have a biodiversity there. And a lot of your insects, like your uh, squash vine borer, will over, uh, they'll pupate in the ground. So if you have a sterile, non-living soil there, that uh, squash vine borer, which is a caterpillar and pupating in the ground, has no... Uh, natural predators, whereas if you have a lot of organic matter, a lot of diversity, you'll pot potentially have uh, predaceous beetles in there that will eat it. You'll have pro potentially predaceous uh, nematodes that may penetrate and feed on it and then reproduce. So if you have a living soil, which again is one of Linda's favorite things on composting and organic soil, is that you tend to have a uh, less of a disease and insect problem because you have all this diversity here. You have a lot of good things going on in there, controlling the bad things that are going on. So soil is a very important thing. You know, having that layer of compost around or the mulch around is very important to getting that soil alive again. And the other misnomer when we talk about compost is, oh, I'm going to go get a bag of compost and put it on here and everything's going to be good. Well, if your soil is lacking something, which would show up with a uh, soil test. And where can you get that done? <laughs> uh, you can go to Texas A&M, pick up a soil bag at uh, the extension office. But if you have a soil that's devoid of certain minerals, and I put a compost on that's also devoid of those minerals, guess what? I've added organic matter, but I still haven't solved the problem. So you need to do some uh, research in there. What do I have? What do I need to add? And... If I'm adding something, is it actually going to take care of what I'm short of? So these are, you know, some things we, you know, organic matter, I agree with it, add it, keep it. But again, you right, got to do right. some analysis. You do, you do have to have the analysis because the organic matter will build a tilth in the soil, but it won't necessarily replace the micronutrients and the macronutrients that we need in the soil. So if I don't have a compost bin at my house then where could I go, um, you know, and, you know, once I get my soil test back and it tells me I need this, are there different types of compost you can buy? 
You can. You can buy uh, compost from some of the local suppliers, and, and uh, you know, two or three come to come to mind, uh, Nature's Way and Living Earth Technology. But again, the quality of that product is important also. So you're looking for an aged compost that is not uh, just, you know, unless you're just doing a surface mulch. But typically people don't dig the compost into their soil. We normally apply it on the surface, let the microbes uh, break down those those uh, lignant elements, those, those elements of, of cellulose, and then bring it into the soil itself as they need it. So is that comparable to putting a mulch on top of, you know, your soil whenever you're planting new plants or like in a flower bed? Correct. That's going to be weed <clears throat> control, moisture control, and also adding nutrients into the soil or adding the tilth into the soil. Okay. Another th good thing to do in the summer, speaking of mulch, is to mulch your garden because that will tend to hold the moisture in and alleviate stress on the plant. Because, like I said before, if your plants are stressed, it's just an invitation for insects to come in and, and take so, advantage. Exactly. And soil temperature and moisture go hand in hand, and we're right. going to start talking about moisture perhaps in the next segment. We are. The, uh, one of the things I've seen currently in my garden is you can actually maintain weed control if you have a heavy enough mulch. Uh, 90 days ago, you know, you could go from a weed-infested garden, you blanket it with either newspaper, or cardboard, and then a mulch layer on top, and you can have a very clean planting bed 90 days from that point. Uh, spot plant for tomatoes, or, or for right now, what would we be putting in? We'd be putting in purple hull peas or something like that, but spot planting, getting ready for the for the fall crops like uh, uh, cabbage and, and collards and Broccoli. Broccoli, that's right. And when do you start planting your fall garden? Uh, when, <laughs> when I get out of When you heat. have extra time. But. Actually, as soon as you pull out your spring one. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much right now you should be getting your tomato plants started to plug in to get them going for the fall. You know, you if you have a favorite tomato plant too that's done real well this spring, you can actually take a cutting off of it, right. root it. Uh, in some nice loose potting soil, keep it moist, keep it in a shaded sunny window, and you'd have that favorite plant going back into the to the fall garden. Put it out what late July, something like that, mm -hmm. early August. Right. And keep it watered. Mulch it. <laughs> <laughs> Sprinkle some mulch on there, and make sure you keep it moist. Okay, sounds good, guys. And we're going to take another short break. And when we come back, we're going to start talking irrigation. That's always on everybody's mind when it starts getting really hot. We'll see you in a minute. Our talk shows and music shows are looking for sponsors. Want to expand your brand awareness? Reach the hyper-local audience in Montgomery County? Lone Star Community Radio sponsorships accomplish this. Want to see our stats and rates? Check out IRLoneStar.com slash sponsor for more information. Or call in and leave us a message at 936-647-3776 with your questions. Get seen on TV, YouTube, and heard on our podcast, FM, and Internet Radio. Support your local radio station with Lone Star Community Radio. Listen in Mondays at noon to hear Conroe news from local nonprofits, businesses, upcoming events, Conroe Park events, news stories, and information that matters to you with your host, Margie Taylor of Taylorized PR. For more information about being a guest, visit IRLoneStar.com slash Conroe Culture. And welcome back to the Extension Hour with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Today we're talking to the Master Gardeners. I wanted to mention um, our office has a Facebook page. It's Montgomery County, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, um, which features pretty much anything that's going on at the office as well as the Agriculture Department. Um, we also have Montgomery County 4-H. If you search that, you can get in touch with our 4-H um, department. We've got Healthy Living in Montgomery County, which is our Family and Consumer Sciences Facebook page. That's actually my department. Um, we like to partner with the Master Gardeners a lot when they have their open garden days. We'll do a food demo that kind of goes along with it. 
Um, we really enjoy doing that. And then the Master Montgomery County Master Gardener Association also has a Facebook page. So check us out there. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can call into the phone room at the Extension Office. The phone number is 936-539-7824. Um, there's usually somebody there from 8 to 12 and 1 to 5 every day. They're very knowledgeable, as you can tell by our guests today. Um, they can help answer your questions, get you set up with a soil sample test. Um, we rent out traps. We do all kinds of stuff there. Um, now we're going to start talking about some irrigation and how to kind of take care of it and, you know, when to water. Where do we go from here? Yeah, right. when to water, how to water. So one of the biggest questions that we get coming in as far as irrigation is concerned is, you know, how much water do I need to, to put on my lawn and how long do I need to run my system? And uh, and Linda told me years and years ago, she said, uh, Jim, you know, if you start thinking about just using your thumb and forefinger and see how moist your soil is, you'll go a long way to understanding the health of your plants. So when people say, well, I run it 10 minutes a day, three days a week, uh, is that enough? You just don't know how much rain have you gotten, how efficient your irrigation system is, and do you have any broken heads? So the first thing I would do if you were to, to look for an irrigation, if you have an automatic irrigation system, understand there are watering restrictions in, in Conroe and in Montgomery County. Understand that typically you want to water, uh, the watering restrictions right now are basically after 5 p.m. and before 9 a.m. or before 8 a.m. in the morning. So it's all that those nighttime hours. And it's really only two days a week right now. They're not restricting handheld sprayers, nor are they restricting drip irrigation or soaker hoses. And curiously enough, they don't restrict car washing or uh, <laughs> or fountain refills either, but that's a different story. Well, another thing you want to think about on irrigation is what type of soil do you have? Yep. Do you have a clay soil? Do you have one with a lot of organic matter? Is it sandy? Because all of those factors will determine how much you irrigate. And the slope of your soil, too. Right. You know, we have a tendency here in uh, building houses is to get that water away from our house as fast as we can. And certainly you don't want a flooded, a flooded front yard, but to get it off and into the street doesn't really do you any good. You want to slow it down, use the water that you put on there wisely, and, uh, and get it directed to your plants, huh, Bill? Yes, sir. It, uh, it's very important that the plant uses it, and in fact there's some... Uh, different landscaping features you can use. You can use a little swale and make like a bog garden so that the water's retained and it infiltrates into the land. Uh, you can also, you know, just be cautious how you do your landscaping. So you one, you want to keep it away from the slab, but again, you want to retain it somewhat in your yard there. And, and certainly look for the native and well-adapted plants. You know, whether they're native or not, I'm not going to get hung up on that word, but well-adapted drought-tolerant, disease-resistant plants. Uh, and St. Augustine is not one of those plants. <laughs> but if you have a St. Augustine lawn, don't cut it so short. If you're cutting that St. Augustine lawn so it's two inches when you finish, that's too short, leave it at four inches in the summertime. And use sharp blades, too. And use sharp blades. Yeah. Get your blades sharpened. If yeah. you've got ragged ends on those leaf blades, your your mower is, uh, blade is dull. And you're actually inviting... Uh, more disease and more bacterial uh, colonies to form on those ragged edges than you will on a sharp cut. Right. But if you cut that grass too short, it's going to spend all of its energy growing the grass blade and not a root system. So leave it long. It'll shade out the weed seeds in the lawn and they won't germinate. How do you feel about mulching mowers picking up that, uh, that, uh, that cutting and recutting it and dropping it back down into the oh, lawn? That's that's great. You know, that, that's great. That, yep. that gives you about 20%, I believe, of your fertilizer that you need. So if you're bagging it and putting it out by the street, that's probably not the best idea for those nutrient-rich no, little clippings. Yeah. Sometimes I bag my, I have the easement to mow, and sometimes I'll bag it, but I put it in my compost pile. If I need some green stuff, I'll go run the mower and put it in my compost pile. But normally, you just want to leave it. And in the fall, raking the leaves, that's an excellent source of uh, free mulch to put into your, uh, into your garden and landscape beds. Right. I have been known to take my husband's pickup truck and go around the neighborhood <coughs> and pick up the bags of leaves on the curb. 
and if the leaves are too big and coarse, uh, you can always uh, run your bagging lawnmower over them and make them into little pieces and take the bag and use it mm -hmm. as a mulch bag and put it around the base of your plants. Uh, or if you uh, don't have a bagging mower because you have a lawn service, you can always use a steel garbage can, put the leaves in there and take a string trimmer up and down. It'll pulverize them and you can dump those out. It will make them small and won't blow away and won't be as obnoxious in your yard. Right. They will decompose faster the smaller they yeah. are. Yes. I know but what it was I forgot to say the other minute was about mulch. One of my pet peeves is piling mulch up around the trunk of trees. It look like little volcanoes. You do not want to do that. You want to see the root flare of that tree and uh, don't pile up mulch. And uh, I had the church that I attend in the woodlands, I talked to the landscape guy, and he said, but everybody does it. And I said, well, does that make it right? And yeah. he said, but our landscaper, and I said, who's paying your landscaper? So That's right. It, it's that saucer effect that you want. You want that little, little soft <laughs> saucer effect that the water is going to settle down into, soak down into the roots of the trees, and get it out three or four feet in diameter. You know, get it, give it some space for that tree to... To, uh, to have a nice shaded area for its root, uh, for its root ball. Yeah, with the volcano approach or any time you leave a lot of mulch pile up around the base of a tree, sometimes the mice will get in there and chew the bark off the tree and totally girdle it. It also, with all that moisture around the base, is a good place for uh, fungal infections to start because it's moist, it's just an ideal environment for them. So if you can keep a couple inches away from the base of the tree, uh, you know, mulch out there, but don't pile all that stuff around the base. It invites uh, some hazards and uh, things that you don't expect to move in there. And, and that's another water conservation technique also. If you've got this volcano piled up around your tree and the mulch is dry and crispy, as, as quite often it is, it just runs right off the top of that little volcano. Whereas if you make a little saucer type thing, it kind of helps yeah. hold that moisture in there and gets it down yeah. into the root of the tree. Correct. Awesome. Correct. Think yeah. of an English thatch roof, and that's what you get when you pile up the, the uh, compost and it gets real dry. It just runs off of it like a thatch roof. We talk about creating little eyebrows uh, here on a slope. If your front yard is sloping toward the street, we talk about creating little eyebrows of mulch toward the downside of that slope so it slows down, kind of slows the water down, catches the gives particulates. Gives it some time to suck in. Right, yep. One of the questions that always comes up is, when do I need to water? And one of the best ways to tell, especially in a yard, is walk through your yard. And if you can see your footprints, they're not popping right back up, then that's usually an indication you're a little devoid of moisture out there. And a screwdriver works real well, too. Get the biggest, longest screwdriver you can and shove it down into the ground and just feel what that moisture feels like, that soil feels like, six, eight, ten inches down into the ground. Because the primary uh, root zone that you've got for most of your lawns and most of your grasses is in that four to six inch range at best. So if you can get a deep soaking in there, keep that four to six inches of uh, soil moist but not soggy, you'll have a nice healthy lawn or nice healthy landscape beds that are 80% of your front yard. That was going to be my next question is, okay, what if you have a flower bed that's on a slope? Is it the same process with the eyebrows? and Pretty much the same process, yeah. Uh, using rock borders will help. Uh, looking for terracing opportunities so that you can kind of terrace it as you go down. Yay, I made a terrace in mine, so I'm excited now. That's right, that's right. <laughs> with some stone, so we have two levels now. So I'm excited about that side. As people put in irrigation also, they, they have typically the pop-up sprayers that they have uh, in landscape beds. Over time, the plants get taller. The, the sprays do not give you the same pattern that you want. So you can try to convert those to drip irrigation. We actually do a number of classes in irrigation and drip conversion so that you can take the pop-up sprays for your landscape beds primarily and convert those to drip irrigation. It gives you a much more efficient, much more water-conscious uh, method of watering your, your landscape beds. So with uh, like a flower bed or a garden of some sort, is is there something that I can do to, if you're making an outline for it or a box for it or something, is there something I can line that in it with? Or, you know, a, a, what's the best way to prepare a flower bed or a, a garden of some sort? 
I would not line it with landscape fabric. Uh, I'm not looking for weed control using a plastic landscape fabric. I'm looking for weed control using heavy mulch. Uh, if you're trying to border the edge of a, of, a, of a garden area or border the edge of a landscape bed, rock is a good choice. Okay. Uh, just stacking stone four to six inches tall. I feel like that cloth is a, is a big mistake that a lot of people make. Um, okay, you know, it's a common mistake that it people is, think that, oh, yeah, that, that would work, but, you know, yeah. It, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. It becomes more of a nuisance as you try to uh, weed and dig yes. plants. So just uh, you don't see a lot of mulch cover out in the forest floor, do you? Not at all. No, sure not. <laughs> that's, well, that's why the newspaper and cardboard is a better option because eventually that will break down. and It will decompose. Right. right. Very right. quickly. Very right. quickly. All right. We're going to take oh, – are you ready? Okay. <laughs> we're going to take another short break, and we'll be back shortly with the extension hour. Our talk shows and music shows are looking for sponsors. Want to expand your brand awareness? Reach the hyper-local audience in Montgomery County? Lone Star Community Radio sponsorships accomplish this. Want to see our stats and rates? Check out ourlonestar.com slash sponsor for more information. Or call in and leave us a message at 936-647-3776 with your questions. Get seen on TV, YouTube, and heard on our podcast, FM, and internet radio. Support your local radio station with Lone Star Community Radio. The Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service has been dedicated to educating Texans for over a century. In 1915, the Extension Program was established under the federal Smith-Lever Act to deliver university knowledge and agricultural research findings directly to the people. Ever since, AgriLife Extension Programs have addressed the emerging issues of the day, serving diverse populations across the state. Texans turn to Extension for solutions in horticulture, agriculture, 4-H and youth, and family and consumer sciences. Extension agents respond not only with answers, but also with resources and services that result in significant returns on investment to boost the economy. Join us Fridays at 1 o'clock for the AgriLife Extension Hour. And welcome back to the Extension Hour. I'm here with Master Gardeners Linda Crum, Bill Boynton, and Jim Buncho who are super knowledgeable, and I'm learning all kinds of new stuff. So I'm excited you guys are here. Um, we're going to jump back into it and start talking about soil structure and eventually get over to fertilizing, because that's always a big question. I always hear people calling or coming in the office wanting to know, well, I didn't fertilize, or I did it too early, or, you know, they always have a lot of questions. So I'm going to let you guys start talking about that. Well, I guess you're right. People ask, when should I fertilize, how much should I fertilize, and... Bill had mentioned before doing soil tests. So you've got a combination of two things you really need to look at is the soil structure and your soil analysis. And if you try to build healthy soil, then uh, you're going to go a long way to minimizing the fertilizer you need to buy, minimizing the cost, and minimizing the runoff that's going to go down into the streets and into our rivers and lakes. Good point. Okay, soil is basically made up of three different sized particles. Uh, you have the very fine stuff, which is your clay. It tends to stick together. If you got clay soil, you can play like a little kid and make a big long roll of it, and it's not going to break apart. And then the next bigger size particle is called silt, and it tends to be sticky, um, and it's sort of intermediate there. And then the largest granules are called sand. And they tend to be fast draining. Silty tends to be more sticky. Clay tends to get bound up and be one that it's hard to have water and things leach through it. But a clay soil can be uh, somewhat moderated by the type of minerals you place into it. There's some uh, uh, things like uh, magnesium and uh, uh, gypsum. You add those to it, it'll loosen up to a point. But then if you go overboard with magnesium, it'll actually make it tighter. So you want to sort of have an idea of what type of soil I have. If you take some soil in your fingers and rub it between there, if it feels gritty, then you know you got some sand there. If it's real slippery, then it's clay. Sticky, it tends to be more of a silt. So you sort of want to have an analysis of what's in there. Clay is not bad in a soil because if it's an open soil with organic matter in there, good tilth, it will hold a lot of your nutrients that you need in the soil because 
Clay has a very high what they call cation exchange capacity. It will hold a whole bunch of these nutrients you need in the soil, whereas sand has very little. You add organic matter to sand, you bring up the cation exchange capacity. But clay actually has the best holding on it. But again, if you don't watch your chemicals, you just blatantly apply chemicals, uh, sometimes you can make it worse. Uh, with clay soils, uh, you know, like I say, they, they can be ameliorated. Uh, again, having a living soil will tend to have the, the bacteria bind up clay particles and tend to make them behave more like a sand particle. So and, these are some important things. Right, and, and we do have a mixture of soils in Montgomery County. You know, somebody will have, even within I have a lot yard. of clay in mine in, yeah. in my flower bed area, and so that's actually very beneficial to know that it actually can be beneficial because I'm always like, Ugh. It will, and we see also a lot of the builders in in many residential areas that will backfill around your house with with whatever they have, and unfortunately, you're you're kind of stuck with that unless you do a lot of work with your soil. and a lot of money. Yeah. Well, what type of particle you have determines the the texture of your soil, and you can't really do much about soil texture, but you can certainly do a lot with soil structure. Right by adding organic matter, like compost, uh, it will actually cause those, cl those clay particles lay on each other like plates. But if you add compost, it makes those plates go at angles, so you open up that clay soil. And of course, it has the water holding capacity, and uh, the water holding capacity of sand is enhanced by using organic matter. So, so how would you incorporate that into the clay? Well, just by applying it as a surface you mulch, can. eventually, and it eventually goes down right. into it. Eventually, the insects will bring it up. The earthworms will will work right. through the soil and distribute it through the surface of the soil, and yeah. and I, even even uh, lower into the soil. I, I can give you an example of that I had a shovel bender soil in Central Texas, and the shovel bender is you jump on the shovel, the shovel bends. And <laughs> I know you what don't you're talking about. <laughs> so, I built some uh, rings out of. Uh, construction uh, reinforcing concrete wire and they were about seven feet in diameter and I just again ran in the neighborhood got the leaves and everything and filled them up and at the end of about two years I broke that ring down and sifted the stuff put it in the gardens and stuff and I could go 29 inches down below where that ring was whereas before I just bend in the shovel there wow and that's how that organic matter will ameliorate some of that hard hard packed soil Another thing you want to be aware of is what is your soil pH? Because a lot of people will use a bag fertilizer and NPK formula, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Well, if you're on an alkaline soil and you get a lot of phosphorus in there, you're going to tie up your iron, manganese, and some of your other micronutrients. So again, a soil analysis is important and also a pH analysis because if you're in the alkaline region, you can get rid of cause a lot of, uh, quote, nutrient diseases on your plants. And the more iron you add, it's not going to do any good. So you got to get that phosphorus out of there and get it balanced. So again, just blindly pouring a, you know, like a 13, 13, 13 or whatever one there year after year, uh, sometimes you can really lock up your soil for a while. I like to use an organic fertilizer. Yeah. Of course, you guys already knew that. but um, <laughs> Really, Linda? <laughs> really. <laughs> If you use a water-soluble fertilizer like um, Scott's or something like that, I don't want to pick on Scott's, but any chemical fertilizer that's water-soluble, it tends to dissolve, the nitrogen anyway, tends to dissolve rather rapidly, and it's gone. It's like eating a huge meal, and then you're starving afterwards. But I get that quick green lawn, Linda, that yes, everyone you, wants. Yes, you do, and the Gulf of Mexico is... Uh, is also getting a nice green algae patch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if you use an organic fertilizer... Or slow release, or organic, slow, right. Right. The uh, microbes in the soil have to break that nitrogen down to a form that the plant can use. And they do it very slowly, so you're not going to have your nitrogen leaching out. People say, well, organic fertilizer costs more, Linda. Well, you're applying it less often, too, because it's not gone the next week after you apply it. Yeah, and, and some of the slow-release fertilizers, like Linda's talking about, the organic uh, one comes to mind is MicroLife, and mm -hmm. uh, that's my favorite. It 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 is in a pellet, it almost looks like little rabbit pellets, uh, 
breaks down with moisture, and but it's breaking down very slowly. It gives you a longer release time. Cotton seed meal, Cotton seed feathers. Meal. Yep. A whole bunch of different things out there that are available that will be a slow breakdown. And Cotton, you, cotton seed meal is pretty inexpensive. Too. Can you get these at any common you know store like a Lowe's or a Home Depot or? Mostly you, feed stores for the cotton seed meal. You can get cotton seed meal at most of the feed stores around town, yeah. Right. Okay. And most of your uh, independent nurseries will have uh, microlife fertilizer yeah. or another or another uh, organic fertilizer. And typically keeping, uh, you know, watering it, I, I guess, moderately after you apply the fertilizer would be a good idea to just kind of soften it and get it in good contact with the soil. See, y'all are embarrassing me. I've been there for seven years, and I've never had my soil tested. And now I'm like, oh, well, i got to go find out what's in my clay so I can know what kind of compost to put in there. I never would have considered a pH balance of, of, of the soil. We I'm can trying. do that at the office. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I never the, even knew yeah. you, that was something you should do. Yeah, the so. Master Gardeners can do that directly in the office. Our soil <laughs> testing kits, you can pick up um, bags and some forms. And you actually send that off to Texas A&M, and they'll send you a report. And sometimes it looks kind of like Greek to the common person like me. <laughs> Um, but I work with some awesome master gardeners and volunteers that I can say, hey, what does this mean? What do I need to add? Um, Jenny, one other thing. Uh, we have a booth at the uh, Conroe Farmer's Market the first Thursday of the month. Uh, right now, the Farmer's Market runs from 4 to 8, and we have a master gardener booth there, and we'll be happy to try to explain the soil test to you. Uh, we're also there if you want to bring in an insect or a plant problem and, and ask us. We'll try to identify it. If not, we'll bring it back and uh, have some other eyeballs take a look at it and get you an answer. Yeah, I know. I know y'all have had a very popular booth since y'all got started. And yeah, this will be July. Will be our one year anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Nice nope. and hot, but you know, bring your stuff. Come talk to yeah. a master gardener. Bill, does the farmers market here in Conroe run year round or is it seasonal? It runs all year, every month, the first Thursday. Every month. And it's over Thursday. at Founders Plaza that's right on right. Uh, the corner of Main, Main Street. And Main, and Main and Metcalf. Metcalf. Yep. And during the winter months, it goes from 3 to 7, but right now it's 4 to 8. All right. That sounds great. Um, so, yes, don't forget to check out our Facebook pages that I mentioned earlier. You can call the office. You can come by and see us. We're at 9020 Airport Road um, in Conroe. We're right across the street from the Lone Star Convention Center near the airport in Montgomery County Fairgrounds. Um, thank you guys for coming. I know it was last minute. We appreciate you guys jumping in, literally, <laughs> and meeting us here and um, coming to talk for the Extension Hour. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for checking out this podcast of Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. If you enjoyed this recording, make sure to check out our past shows online at IRLoneStar.com or their respective video or podcast formats on YouTube, Google Play, or iTunes. If you have any questions regarding the show, either it being about sponsorships or questions for the host, contact the station manager at D-I-C-K at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936-647-647. 3776. This show was recorded in downtown Conroe, Texas at the Lone Star Community Radio Studio. And Lone Star Community Radio reserves all rights to this recording and images.